this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You exactly. say things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. And if we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast series, How Did We Get Here? I try to provide context and background to a big story in the news by talking to someone with real expertise in the field. Today I'm talking to Minette Batters, the first woman to lead the National Farmers Union. It's fair to say on her watch she's had plenty to deal with already. Brexit, Covid and the nail-biting wait to see if there be a trade deal with the EU. Is this a brave new world for farmers? Or are we asking too much of them? They must look after the countryside, their animals, see off foreign competition and provide us with food at a price we can afford. And in the end, are we all going to have to pay more, either through subsidy or higher prices in our shops to make that happen? Manette Batters, thanks very much for talking to us for this edition of How Did We Get Here? We're now just over a month into the brave new world of coming out from EU rules. Broadly speaking, where are your members? Are they elated? Are they excited? Are they worried? Are they shocked? What's going on with them? Well, we're in this sort of slightly strange place at the moment where not a lot has changed for the vast majority. For some, obviously, you know, there's a lot of friction into Northern Ireland um, for specialist cheese exporters. There is an element of, of friction um, at the border. But because of COVID, it is masking the current situation because out of home eating isn't, isn't happening as we know it. So everybody is buying everything that they are eating out of retail. Now, retail is, is very loyal to buying British. So prices are actually quite good. Um, so farmers at the moment uh, are, are sort of, uh, you know, pretty happy. The weather, as always, is, is challenging and it's been an incredibly wet winter. But on the whole, things at the moment are OK. But that said, you know, we've got these trade deals back at the table with Canada, uh, third round of New Zealand, Australia looking like being completed by the summer. This is when things will change. OK, well, we'll come back to all those things. I mean, presumably, just get, get back into the EU context, you must have been hugely relieved that a deal was done with no tariffs and no quotas. Was that, was that fair? absolutely delighted that we had a, a deal that came through at, at the 11th hour and to be trading uh, tariff and quota free is is you know really really good news um for both sides you know there is a, there is a level of friction friction equals cost but a no deal scenario as you heard me say time and time again would have been disastrous and we've avoided that and this is the start of a new relationship with the EU OK, but where are those frictions coming? Because presumably there are, let's talk about exporters. There are people, as we know, who are struggling to get their, their goods exported in, into the EU at the moment. Who's suffering the most? It's really, um, it's really about the groupage, and that's why you're seeing the problems with fish. You know, if you've got a load of one product um, that can go through effectively with, you know, with one check, then you've got less friction. If you've got groupage, on a truck of, of different things, that's where the friction sets in and the time delay set in. So it's, it's a group issue, really. And I, I think in time, traders will adjust to more of a sort of wholesale approach, um, you know, sending single loads. It, it, you know, the digital aspect will also come on stream. It, it was always with a deal being completed in you know that sort of 11th hour program that there was always going to be a challenge as to what that deal was what it looked like and what was implemented so there are there are costs there trade of course is down you know you're seeing a lot less exports that that a, a lot of that is because of covid um so we're you know we're in a, a changing climate but as i say it's an iterative process this you know it's going to take time to bed in and it will change that's for certain i mean do you think these are teething problems or that presumably there are some things that are structural now which are which are bedded in which may be difficult for for your members to export there are some structural things you know health certificates has been problematic there seems to be enough uh, veterinary capability at the moment to cope with it but there, there are teething problems There were always going to be you know you don't end um 40 years of of free and frictionless trading relationship and go to 
a new way of trading without there being some challenges. But I think on the whole, um, we've got less trade for other reasons. On the whole, things are working reasonably well. The Irish situation is is a separate issue completely, and we are what we are seeing is is other routes being used. So. I think, you know, as the months play out, getting to July, it will be interesting to see then, um, you know, where we're at. And the implication, of course, with the UK-EU relationship on the impact of other trade deals, that is yet to play out as well. OK, well, we'll come back to trade deals. But let me ask you about subsidy. Obviously, a complete change in subsidy regime now. No more common agricultural policy. Are there people, are, you, are your members worried about that? Um, or do they think, are they feeling reasonably confident there will be something that will replace that, which may even serve them better? Well, for the term of this parliament, the, the budget has obviously been secured and the government has set a seven year transition to step away from um, common agricultural policy payments. So there will be an election, of course, that falls mid term um, and then decisions will be made about you know, whether this is um, a complete approach to public monies for public goods. Um, or whether there is a, a, you know, a section maybe of direct support that remains to cope with market volatility. I mean, we should be under no illusions that the proposals are are a global first. Um, it's never been done before, and it will be challenging and very different for farmers. When I look at the environment bill and the legislation that will be coming in place. Um, you know, we will be expecting our farmers to deliver more for the environment, separate in many cases to food production and trading with the rest of the world, um, you know, which is obviously on very, very different terms. So our regulation costs a lot of money. And in what we are going to see is a lot of that regulation put into law. So raising uh, the legislation bar here at home. And it, it makes it really important that we focus on sustainable farming, which we believe we can absolutely be global leaders in in climate friendly farming effectively getting to the point where we can produce carbon neutral food by 2040 um, but it, it is about really making the case collectively for that and of course the other difficult thing here is we're four nations one country so we've got to try and agree a framework across all four countries so we don't distort the uk single market so if we are asking farmers to be more environmentally friendly to produce more and be able to compete, um, are we going to uh, consumers in the end going to be absorbing a lot of the costs of that? It, well, any government in the world wants food prices to to remain, um, you know, whether it can static and affordable. And the big success with the UK is that we are the most affordable food in Europe per income spend, and the third in the world. So you've only got the US and Singapore that sits ahead of the UK. So. So we've got affordable food. Nobody will want to see food inflation. And my absolute priority is that we don't drive a two-tier food market. You know, ultimately, we make sure that everybody in this country can afford to buy high quality British food. Now, what I said about retail, retail has been growing. It's, it's by British content, if you like. We need to see that happening across the out-of-home market as well. So restaurants, hotels, pubs, when they come back online, we need to try and build those same supply chains, which some, like McDonald's, already have. They've had huge investment in the UK and Ireland. Um, and we need others to do the same. That That is a really, really important thing when, when COVID, the new normal, appears. Do you think COVID has maybe reminded people or helped make the argument that you need to produce more at home? Oh, very much so. I mean, we have followed one poll research uh, on an annual basis And this year, what we saw was a jump of 11 percent of people surveyed. So going from 75 to 86 percent of people surveyed, believing that farmers should be able to produce more food in this country. I think everybody faced the fact of empty shelves, not being able to buy what they wanted when they wanted it. Uh, An element, certainly in the early days of panic buying and now people not able to go out. So they are effectively buying everything that they are eating from retail and it's it has reconnected people with their diet getting back to whole foods cooking from scratch and that's all i think really really positive but there are obviously some things we can't produce very easily in these islands i mean are, are people going to have to get used to the fact that maybe they will not see some of the products they were used to seeing on their shelves 
that maybe came from further afield or if they do that it's going to be more expensive i don't think so because um you know we're obviously never going to be producing um, bananas here or citrus fruits uh, there is no reason for for that to change at all we are going to see more raw ingredients coming onto our marketplace and what consumers will want to see and, and why they drew such a line in the sand last year with our food standards petition, we're, don't forget one in 60 people signed it saying that they wanted trade deals to be fair. They wanted the food that was imported to be produced wherever possible to the same standards. The trick will be making sure that we keep stability of home production. So 60% self-sufficient at the moment. We don't want to see that marginalized and producing less here. But, you know, trade is a, is a good thing. And if we can have, a, a, I guess, more of a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom, um, that will be good for consumers across the world. It'll be good for the environment um, and it'll deliver on climate change, which, of course, this year with the G7 and the COP26 couldn't be more important. I mean, at the time, um, you know, about a year ago, when there was lots of talk about the, the trade deal with the United States, you know, Michael Gove and others were very keen to say this would not compromise either food standards or animal welfare standards. I mean, do you really feel reassured by those comments or do you still worry that that almost inevitably that is something that could get into a trade deal? It, it all remains to be seen, quite honestly. I mean, you know, we are now entering third round with New Zealand back at the table with Canada, Australia going to be completed and then Trans-Pacific of course kicking off with all of those same countries. I know having talked to them, I've talked to the Australians, the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the US, they see this market as a very very attractive food market. You know the US has referred to it as an untapped potential. So they want to gain market access to you know effectively the 70 million consumers that we have here. And we know that agriculture is the difficult part of any trade deal. You know, it, it's not going to be easy when you are a service based economy. Don't forget, agriculture for Australia is a big part of their export strategy. The same with those other countries, Commonwealth countries I mentioned. It's not for us. You know, goods is 20 percent of our economy. So this is a challenge going forwards. And um you know, it does require real leadership and real joined up government. So, you know, where DEFRA and DITR might not be in the same place that, you know, they're going to have to strike, you know, a very hard bargain in order not to compromise farmers in this country. I mean, can you give me a specific example of the sort of area where your members worry that if there was a deal uh, that they would simply be undercut, they would simply not be able to compete? Well, beef in Australia is quite a good example because their costs of production uh, are much lower. Um, you know, here we, we've we got regulation that costs money uh, in effect. So um, that adds to your bottom line, that just drives that up. Australia, they will be producing beef probably for 50% less of, of what it costs us to produce that, that beef. Um, and they have access to things like growth promoters that were banned here back in the 1980s. So if you if you had um, unfettered access for Australian beef into the UK market, um, I think it would not so much in retail, but out of home eating, you know, would do a, a lot of damage because the UK would then become uncompetitive. Be big ramifications for Ireland as well, of course, because we're not self-sufficient in beef here, but we do import quite a bit from Ireland. So it would displace um, potentially Irish beef and it would make our farmers not that competitive. So George Eustace, just to finish this off, George Eustace will say there's going to be a restriction, you know, there will be um, non-tariff barriers put in place, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, George Eustace, the, the, the Environment Secretary, uh, the Minister responsible for this. Um, well, what about from the consumer's point of view, though, just say, well, why don't we just label it clearly? And then everyone can say they can make their choice. It can be on the shelves um, or even in, uh, as you say, out of home eating restaurants or places like that. You can label it clearly. And if people want to choose that, for instance, when they're shopping, they can say, well, I want to pay a bit less. I understand what goes on with Australian beef, for instance, um, it can be there and it can be a market and the, and the consumer can choose. Uh, labeling works well in retail and retail is very transparent and, and you know exactly what you're buying 
there is no way at this moment in time of regulating out of home eating. So what you are eating when you go to a hotel or restaurant, it could say that it's British, um, uh, but there's no way of knowing that it is. So labelling doesn't work with 50 percent of the value of the market. And then, of course, you've got things like procurement, our hospitals, our schools that again um, you know, you've got no way of knowing what you're eating there. So whether it says British doesn't necessarily mean to say that it is. And that that's a big part of the market going for going forward. So, you know, retail labeling works out of home procurement labeling just doesn't work. You'd have to look at another form of regulation in order to drive a transparent approach where customers knew exactly what they were buying. What about procurement? That's interesting. I, was just, I mean, would you like to see the government make a, a commitment to say we are going to source locally food for you know the nhs or whatever it is or, or you know, all sorts of government departments does that happen already or do you or do you think there should be a, a drive to make sure that happens this has been long-term project really for us and in fact owen patterson when he was secretary of state in defra for the london olympics he introduced all british sourcing for the london olympics so they worked through Red Tractor Assurance to be able to say that it was 100% British, produced here, processed here and packed here. And that was very successful. And he was very keen, and I know regrets the decision to step back from it enormously. He was very keen to roll out procurement for hospital schools, military prisons that was, wherever possible, all British. Um, the Crown commercial contract that drives the pricing um, for those caterers supplying into hospitals and schools is set incredibly low. So I think for the NHS, it's something like £3.50 per day for three meals. So you can't do fresh, let alone British, for that price. And it's the same for the military as well. So you'd have to look at lifting the Crown commercial price contract in order to be able to be sourcing British. But you know, when we're talking about the NHS and, and the journey back to health, you know, the food that we eat is so incredibly important. You know, we feel it's it's a real opportunity. I mean, do we as a country and maybe do we as consumers have to accept that we will have to put a bit more money, whether it's in some form of subsidy or whether in terms of what we pay in the shops to ensure that we have a successful, sustainable, green healthy farming industry in this country? I think, you know, food prices, I, I would say this is about globally leading a, a, a race upwards. Um, you know, commodity food prices are, are always being traded against, always enormous pressure on, on price. What would be disastrous here is to drive that two-tier food market. We, we must have a common approach that is fair to people that are trading and we try and drive common and fair standards of, of how those goods are being produced. That, you know, that is what is needed. Um, I think to be talking about food inflation when we've got such austerity here, you know, nobody wants to see that. The farmers I represent want to be able to produce high quality, affordable food for every budget. If it's not in prices, is in in the way that the, the future subsidy, if we have a future subsidy regime, um, would work that you know again as a country we want our farmers to do lots and lots of things not the you know produce food look after the countryside make it nice for people driving through it i mean is 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 it fair to say that in that situation where you're asking farmers to operate in a market but a but a, a very regulated market that the state should be prepared to pay a bit more for it uh, there's a really good case to be made and it's the point that i make all the time that you know, future support, future investment, if you like, into into rural Britain, into farming policy has to be focused on the things that the market isn't going to pay for. And, you know, animal welfare is, is a great example and environmental protection. You know, we all want to be able to, to have those things. We don't necessarily want to pay for it. So ways that we can fund uh, animal welfare and environmental payments. So that means keeping food production and the environment intrinsically linked. If we can do it that way, I think then you can make up for the cost effectively, those hidden costs that farmers carry um, and, and make sure that you know they have vibrant, profitable businesses and, and customers have the product that they want. And we have the countryside effectively and the environment that we want to see here. So, so does that mean that the state has to put in a bit more subsidy? maybe than we've been used to doing? 
Potentially, I think we have to recognise, though, that, you know, COVID, we, we've got huge, um, huge debt, I think 2.13 trillion of national debt at the moment. So the more we can make businesses stand on their own two feet, have fair supply chains, um, Secretary of State George Eustis has done a lot in the dairy sector to make sure that you have a fairer contract that delivers a fair return back to the farmer. Sector by sector, that's different, but that that is a key part of the future. And, you know, the three billion pounds worth of investment under the EU banner that has been secured for the term of this parliament, I think that would basically run central government uh, for, you know, a month. So it has shown phenomenal return on investment. We feel that, you know, we could have a better policy that really delivers, but without doubt, you know, investing in our countryside, in our food, to keep food affordable is, is going to be an important part. Just changing direction slightly. Um... What do your members make of the maybe changing habits of the of the UK consumer? Um, more and more vegetarians, um, fewer you know, fewer people eating meat, more people not drinking uh, cow's milk. Um, is this starting to have a real impact on your members in terms of their sort of investment decisions looking ahead? I mean, if you look at the sort of twenty somethings in the UK at the moment, there's clearly a trend away from eating meat and and drinking dairy. Um, milk, uh, dairy products. Um, what, do, what do your members make of that? Well, we're actually not seeing that. I mean, without doubt, what we are seeing is the rise of a flexitarian diet. So people who are choosing um, to take meat out of a diet for, for one day, maybe more per week. But talking to all the retailers, they are actually seeing sales of meat increasing um, at the moment as people look to be a bit more, um, I guess, expansive in what they want to cook, not being able to go out. So, for instance, lamb sales have, have never been as high as they are now. So I think we're seeing a, a customer base that is changing. Um, for, for us as farmers, it's about getting people back to whole foods, natural ingredients, a healthy, balanced diet. You know, cow's milk is a, a fantastic um, part of a healthy, balanced diet. And in many ways, you know, far better off having cow's milk than you know potentially other milks that have a huge amount of water that create unsustainable problems across other parts of the world so it is back to that healthy balanced diet and what are the best components of it which meat and dairy are a vital part of it but we all need to eat more more fruits and more vegetables of which we should be producing much more here in the uk because we have the climate to do it I mean, just uh, dairy, so dairy farmers, you're not seeing a trend away from demand for 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 you know cow's milk. That's that's just not that's just not a not a fact. No, we're not. Um, you know, prices at the moment, um, both here and globally, despite COVID, uh, are reasonably are reasonably good. Um, so you know, it, it's it's not something that is playing out on on the ground. People are changing their diets, but as I say, it's getting to more of a flexitarian approach than it is vegan or vegetarian, um, and definitely valuing. I think getting back to whole foods and and that the whole approach to a healthy, balanced diet. Are your members optimistic at the moment? I mean, it's the old joke that farmers are always a bit gloomy, which is very unfair. But, um, you know, you, you've obviously been around the industry a, long, you know, a, a fair while. Um, do you feel that they they feel optimistic or are they, are they concerned about what's coming? There, uh, look, farming has evolved for millennia. There, there is no doubt this is a, a period of major change. Um, so, uh, you know, all the farmers I speak to, you know, that I we've all got to be looking at our businesses we've all got to be preparing for change making sure that that we are ready for that but I think you know they they recognize the role they have in feeding the nation um there is huge public support out there for for farming when I look at how the reputation has grown over over the years and I look at the standards we have here you know we are the number one supplier of choice to the UK food market. And, and the you know, the, the challenge has to be keeping us there and uh, keeping us producing what the what the consumer, the shopper wants. That's the main thing. And do you have faith that coming out of the CAP um, and a, a UK government and, and with the devolved administrations as well, that that is going to you know, create a better environment in which your members can thrive than maybe the old EU system? It's, it's a 
period, as I said, of, of enormous change, and we have to get this right. So the seven year transition is is really important. I think what people value in this country is that we have all sorts of different sizes of farming. You know, we have tenant farmers here. Uh, we have small farmers, we have large farmers, but that makes the fabric of our countryside. What people don't want to see um, is, you know, businesses consolidating and we drive larger scale sort of agribusiness. They like to see that the demographic that we have at the moment. So there's a lot of pressure on everybody to get the future right. It is a game changer. Um, and we have to make sure that, that we all work together so that we do have a, a a vibrant future because 70% of the UK is a farm landscape. You know, it's not urban is, is a very small proportion. So we've got to make sure that this works, that this stacks up because otherwise it is going to be hugely detrimental to the countryside and, and nobody wants to see that. Now, I think you have children. If one of them came to you and said, mum, I really want to go into farming. I want to be a farmer. Would your heart leap or how would you feel? Oh, I'd be absolutely delighted if one of them wanted to farm. And, and I say that to, to everybody and it's, it's going to change, but everybody needs to eat. Um, I think COVID has, has again driven more of a staycation approach, people getting out in the countryside, walking the footpaths, getting the health and well-being benefits of being out and staying in the countryside. So it's a period of change, but it is a period of enormous opportunity and to a certain extent, the opportunity that we all make it. Minette Batters from the NFU, thanks very much for talking to us. Thanks so much. Minette Batters of the National Farmers Union. I guess the fact she'd be happy for her children to follow her into the business is a good sign. If you have thoughts on this or ideas for another podcast, you can email me at andy.bell at itn.co.uk. I'm tweeting at at andybell5news. Please share, rate and review as well. Thanks for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another along soon.